Natalia Gaidamesco, welcome. Uh, Natalia uh, is a professor and associate dean at the Faculty of Education at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Natalia got a, a BA in psychology in 1981 from Moscow University. And I think it was there in Moscow that you first learned about Vygotsky. Is that right? Yes, I was very, very fortunate to enter Moscow University in 1978. Uh, interesting fact, uh, Leontiev was our dean, albeit only for the one semester. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1979. But I had so many wonderful professors. Um, like, uh, I mean, it, it's hard to name just a few, but I would have to name, for example, Bluma Wolf from Zergarnik who was a graduate student of Kurt Levine, was our part of psychology professor. Uh, my professor, Homska Evgenia Davidovna, was Luria's graduate student. So it's, it was just a marvelous opportunity for me. And if we say education changed someone's lives, Moscow University definitely changed mine. Yes. OK. Um, now, you were one of the first, among the first to introduce Vygotsky to the mainstream in North America, along with Michael Cole in the University of California, San Diego. Is that right? And can you tell me about those early experiences? I, I can't take uh, like my role as a one of the first. I'm, I'm sorry, Andy. I, I think by the time that I arrived in North America, a lot of really uh, prominent scholars already promoted Vygotsky and of course Michael Cole who as you know and I know was the, the most important figure in bringing Vygotsky into North America. He was the one who uh, who went to Russia right and he worked with Luria and um, upon return he published Mind and Society that there was a crucial historical point after which the interest to Vygotsky studies sparked. But it, there were so many to name, right? Jim Wirtz, Uriel Angstrom. So I, I kind of can't say that I was the one who was <laughs> in the first echelon, so to speak. Well, I did my share when I moved over, right? To, to, from the old country to new country. I, I did a lot of things to promote Vygotsky in North America. I was... I hope I was instrumental for uh, American Addiction Research Association Special Interest Group on Cultural Historical Activity Theory. I was an officer there for a few years. I was a co-editor on Mind, Culture, and Society Journal. I, in my um, university in Canada, I created, which I this is I can take pride of, the first master degree in North America, which was titled Cultural Historical Activity Theory Masters of Education. So I, it's not known to me that anyone else did that. Uh, so I, I would say I was among a really group of prominent scholars to which I was, you know, it's it just my honor to belong. And it's fun to work with them and, it, and I hope we will continue in the future. Yes, I suppose for your age, I should realize that you, you, you just couldn't possibly be uh, one of the first in that sense, because you're just you're actually a generation younger than someone like uh, Mike Cole. But I do notice that, for instance, I mean, your uh, associate dean in the Department of Faculty of Education at a very prominent university, and one of the things with chat is it has tended to be um, sort of isolated. In order to do his work, Mike Cole has had to basically create special departments where he can do his work. And it's uh, notable that you're, you've been able to take up a very senior position in the Faculty of Education there, not just uh, put in a kind of ghetto for Russian people. You've, in that sense, broken to much a very wide uh, front into psychology, which I yes, appreciate. Uh, and, that, and that's why I said when I arrived, the interest was so high already. Mm -hmm. That I couldn't, and I only appreciate the work people before me, like Michael Cole, right? I, mm -hmm. I didn't arrive into sort of a desert terrain. I arrived in, on the heights of interest of God, into Vygotsky study. This is how I felt. I, I felt very good. Everybody mm -hmm. was interested. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, um, 
I understand that one of your important contributions to understanding Vygotsky in the West is that you have maintained throughout close relationships with his family. Um, and could you explain to me what has been the role uh, of his family in the development and propagation of his ideas in, in the West? Oh, yeah, I would with pleasure talk about Gita Lvovna Vygotsky, Vygotsky's daughter, whom I consider to be my friend, and Vygotsky's granddaughter, Elena Evgenievna Kravtsova. Uh, Gita Vygotska, after the perestroika, after it was possible for her to travel abroad, after the Iron Curtain disappeared, uh, spent a uh, you know, tremendous amount of effort and time to promote her father's works abroad. And um, she traveled a lot and she attended different conferences as a keynote speaker. And on some of these occasions, I was her translator. She, she trusted me enough and it was a pleasure. So this is the way uh, I, I consider my sort of an impact into helping Gita to talk about her father. Uh, Gita and Yelena, the daughter and the granddaughter, not only travel to the conferences, they actually uh, made an effort to create Vygotsky Institute and the, at the Russian um, University of Humanities. In the beginning of 2000, they, they actually created the institute named by Vygotsky. And there was a lot of activities uh, internationally. They had the, um, in every November, they had the Vygotsky readings, international readings of Vygotsky studies. So I would typically bring my graduate students, my colleagues and, and the delegations from US or Canada to Moscow to those readings. There was a lot of international participation and interest at that time. And it was a very energetic and very optimistic time for Vygotsky Institute in the beginning of 2000. So that's, um, but in general to have Gita in uh, Gita Lvovna, in, in sort of a, in the midst of our conversations and dialogues about Vygotsky was absolutely unprecedented gift. Uh, because, uh, you know, Gita was maintaining the Vygotsky archive. Vygotsky family has this extensive Vygotsky archive. And, um, and she was just a, a marvelous source of, uh, like endless anecdotes and stories about Vygotsky life and, and everything. And, and I just, I want to share one episode just to show you how great it was to be with Gita, to be a friend of Gita Lvovna and to have Gita with us. Uh, it was a story, in, in, I think it was beginning of 2000, there was an article published in the North American Journal. And, and it was to do with, um, Dewey traveling to Russia. I'm not sure if you know that historical fact. So Dewey was in Russia for, for a brief time. And the author of the article made the assertion that because Vygotsky was a student in the university at the time that Vygotsky went to listen to Dewey lecture and uh, there's nothing new Vygotsky created. He was just sort of a secondary interpretation of Dewey theory. But as you can understand, the claim was quite, let's put it, interesting and not to say outrageous uh, for, for us, for Vygotskians. <laughs> With all due respect to Dewey, right? uh, the dialectical philosopher, I really respect Dewey, but, but it was just this sort of assertion about things which supposedly happened. So I remember very clearly calling Gita and saying, Gita, I just read this article. Do you know anything about you know, Vygotsky mentioning you know, meeting Dewey or something. And, and Gita told me an interesting thing. Vygotsky was a prolific diary keeper. Like he, he wrote a lot, right? Any meeting, any book he read, he had this sort of a set of notes. And Gita said immediately, say, well, I'm sorry, Natalia, but there's no mentioning of Vygotsky meeting Dewey. And if such an event would occur, I'm sure Vygotsky would write it down, right? Imagine. So that, that case was immediately solved for me, right? I was like, okay, thank you, Gita. So just to illustrate how, uh, how great this sort of interwining of the professional and personal, in, at least in my career with Vygotsky family and Vygotsky is, 
and, and how sad we all are when we lost Yitan 2010. It, it was a tremendous loss to the, you know, to the world of science and to Vygotsky especially, and to her friends and family. Could you just tell me one little uh, thing? It's a feature, I don't know if it's just Vygotsky and traditional roots of Russian science in general for the children and grandchildren of great scientific figures to, to be uh, quite leading advocates and um, proponents of the science in later generations. This doesn't happen in the West, very rarely. Uh, and I suspect it's something to do with the political conditions in, in the Soviet times. Could you tell me a bit about how this comes about? Well, you're very observant because we do have these generations of psychologists like Vygotsky or Leontiev, right? And it, it's sort of a curious fact, right? I don't know how to interpret it. In Gita's case, in Vygotsky case, it was definitely the uh, sort of a result of political oppression, right? Because Gita's mother and Gita herself were feeling um, a sort of obligation to preserve Vygotsky's scientific legacy, right? In, in the situations which was absolutely uh, not uh, positive, right? As you know, Vygotsky books were supposed to sort of burn expelled and taken from libraries, right? So in Gita's case, it definitely was a political influence, but in case of just a generation of psychologists in Soviet, in Soviet psychology, I think it, it, it may be the case of sort of uh, children and great children being attracted to this wonderful set of ideas which running in the family, right? And being immersed in these ideas from the get-go. If, if you take some other families' cases, but Gita definitely was devoted to make sure that her father's legacy was, you know, preserved for the history. And they've certainly done that very well too. Now, just to get on to some uh, matters of uh, substance, um, I, I watched your uh, series of very short lectures recorded in 2011. And I found, thought you had a brilliant way of explaining a lot of complex ideas in this area, and particularly the uh, method of rising from the abstract to the concrete, as we say. Could you explain what this means to us? Okay, th thank you, Andy. I think we should finish the interview. You just called me brilliant. That's it. I can't achieve any other levels of brilliancy, but thank you for the compliment. Uh, but back to the rising from concrete to abstract. Th this is, I think, one of the most powerful ideas which I learned through Vygotsky from Hegelian dialectic, right? But I first found it in Vygotsky when he explained that the, he, he's a Goethe verse. He said that um, the tree of the abstract ideas are very dry and the role of psychologists to bring it to the concrete life, right? So in that sense, we're talking about sort of opposite to formal logic idea that, you know, the concrete is simple and easily attainable, tangible, and abstract is something that was very difficult to attain. We, we talk about that in, in schools, we're saying that children cannot attain abstract ideas. But in, in sort of dialectical logic, the situation is, reversed, right? And I, I like to explain it to my students a lot of times in the sense that, well, first the metaphor, one of the most powerful metaphor is about patriotism, right? The, I think uh, Vygotsky uh, borrowed from Hegel saying, if you ask yourself um, who has the most powerful concept of patriotism, a child who probably in about a flag of a country, a little bit about their community, a young child, right? And, and sort of become patriotic in a sense, or a veteran who just fought a war for the country and was devoted all, all his or her life, all the way to the shedding the concrete blood on the battlefield for the country to be a patriot, right? So, and the answer is, of course, the veteran has much more concrete understanding of what the patriotism is 
versus this initial abstraction that the little child has, right? That I, you know, this is my country, I'm proud to be uh, a citizen of this country. So, and that sort of a reversing this thinking about what is more uh, difficult to attain, right? And sometimes it takes a life to attain to be a real patriot, right? Uh, I make my students think about this sort of a connection between concrete and abstract, right? And uh, in the curriculum, it's actually a very interesting task because what you able to bring to the group of people in your classroom it's just an initial abstraction to which they don't even relate yet fully, right? And I believe that the job of a professor or teacher is to make the student walk and walk their own walk to attain the very concrete understanding of the concept, right? But without them doing their walk and doing their activities, learning activities, uh, the initial abstraction just remained the dry concept which they don't even relate to, right? So this is how I uh, think about arising to concrete. And this is how I think about creating the curriculum in our classrooms. Because like, for example, in my classroom, I typically will have people from all walks in life in master classroom, from different professions and different uh, life stories. And I need to teach them something about, well, let's say, curriculum or learning or development, right? So I can only provide the initial abstraction to them and then make them think hard and create their own concrete concept applicable to their concrete situation in their classrooms. Because I'm not in their classroom. So this is how abstract country dialectic works very nicely, I think. I One of my favorite philosopher Lienko has this marvelous article about knowledge and activity. And he uses the same idea explaining that if we just provide the ready-made knowledge to our students, ready-made, he said, very abstract, say, okay, we're talking about education today, right? Uh, this knowledge is nothing for them. They don't, you know, it's just an abstract, abstract shell, initial abstraction. And then they have to do their own activities to really attain the core and essential characteristic of this concept. What education means for them, for example, right? So it's this sort of dialectical idea, which, which sort of opposite to the formal logic understanding of what abstract and what concept is. Well, as, as a Hegelian expert, you know what I'm talking about, right? So this initial abstraction is easy to attain exactly. to the concrete understanding, not easy. That's right. Now, as an associate dean, um, you obviously don't just teach, you have a lot of uh, management responsibility there. And I noticed that uh, human resources and management is one of your interests as a researcher. Could you, I mean, I, I've never come across this before among a chat scholar is interested in, in management and human resources. Could you tell me uh, what uh, insights, particularly Vygotsky and Luria and company have given you into this field of psychology? Oh, well, it, it's very interesting because once you learn the powerful frameworks of to thinking about and problem solves the situation, it's very hard to get rid of them, even when you read about some other frameworks, right? So I can, for example, you know, which example would be quick and, and more illustrative, uh, say like, I always approach analysis of situation from the point of view of activity theory. And I, I really mean it. So I need to understand what the subject of activity wants to achieve, what the object of activity is. So uh, when I, um, I'll give you this example. Uh, at some point in my faculty, we were trying to divide uh, or sort of a crystallized understanding what the EDD degree means, educational doctorate versus PhD doctorate, right? So there is a two different degrees and people are writing dissertations and there was a lot of confusions of what, what is it? Is there any difference between PhD and MD? And actually uh, activity theory analysis came very helpful when I was uh, sort of presenting it to my faculty members and saying, 
let's just do the analysis. What is the object of both activities? Who are the communities? What's the division of labor? And, and, and why we have so much confusion over it. And it turned out that confusion was actually about division of labor because in the classical PhD studies, the advisor to PhD students usually very intimate and very close relationship. Our educational doctoral study was designed to be a cohort study. So the cohort of doctors who studied together. And so the 30 people or 25 people had only one advisor. So our professors rebelled, they say, because they were used to the different activities and the scientific advisors, right? They, they wanted one-to-one. -one. And here was a cohort of doctoral students. So once we understood that the division labor was a problem because I mean, the professors were using the all activities of how to advise individual PhD students, uh, we redesigned the role when we said, well, the, the sponsor of the cohort is actually just a broker between his doctoral students and some other experts in community who will be actually serving as uh, advising. I, I don't know if that example came through, but the activity theory was my tool to explain that we're dealing with the different types of activities here, though as a result, both our type of students, doctoral, students and they wrote their thesis, right? But it's, it's in the nuances where the conflict lies. That would help me to do that. Um, I don't know if I use it, if I teach as I preach, is I use it totally in, in everyday sort of administration, my knowledge, but it is helpful to analyze the problem at, at the very minimum, right? So that's, that's how, how I use it. That's very, very helpful, you see, because one, I learned that uh, Leontief was like the, the top boy at the time you first started university. So it's not like you, you had no contact with him. And now I learned that you're using Engelstrom's version of activity theory in understanding the organization of which you're a part. See, I'd always taken you, Natalia, as like a straight down the line Vygotsky person. And I've never heard you talking about uh, and actually uh, utilizing Engelstrom's theory before. So this is very interesting for me, I'm, I'm learning. Um, could you tell me a bit more then, I mean, you describe on your webpage is your, that you teach Vygotskyan Lurian uh, theory and you don't self-describe yourself as an activity theorist, but now you, tell me that that's an accidental thing that you are an activity theory. Could you explain to me a bit about the, these different currents and how you see them? And for me, yeah. it's all one big family, but tell me a bit how you see it. I agree with you. There is no wall for me between Vygotsky and say Leonte theory, right? We know a lot of uh, sort of a different interpretation and, and relationship changing historically between two. But I, I'm the one who believe, like you believe, the chat family, this, the theories, they have too much more in, con in common to sort of put a wall between them. And for me to say that I use only Vygotsky theory, I, I should probably change my website and, and stick Leon to somewhere there, because this is the way I think about situations, right? But also in, in, in sort of a... Um, more practical sense, I do teach special topic seminars on activity theories. This is where some of the doctoral students have a request to, to have it if they need it. So it's not like regular class I teach. And remember that master program which I created, they actually had the name CHAT. It wasn't just Vygotskyan. It was master degree in education, Vygotskyan slash CHAT. So, and then, and that it's a two years degree masters and there is a course on activity theory on that as well. I, I believe it depends on um, like which unit of an analysis is better uh, fitted for the problem solving in situation. So it, it it's really depends on what you want to achieve. So sometimes one framework of thinking uh, sort of more, more catering to the situation than others. Uh, when I, for example, analyze situation with um, special need children, right? I definitely use a lot of Luria background I have. 
Uh, I, I don't know if, if I have it on my website, but I was the principal of school for special needs children for a few years here in Canada. And uh, Luria's um, sort of culture, historical, neuropsychological side of, of my knowledge was very helpful to analyze the situation there. When it comes to organizations, of course, uh, not only activity theory, there's also the Q methodology, which I sometimes employ, which is totally not the gut skin, but could be uh, in sort of attached to the gut skin understanding of uh, subjectivity being a very complicated concept. Right? So I, I use all kinds of tools if it's good for my situation. Yeah. Now, along those lines, I notice you also list among your interests, uh, you call it uh, a study of subjectivity or or the Q methodology, the, the common kind of things of, you know, writing different claims and and uh, and so on, which is done in you know uh, electoral sort of opinion surveys and so on. Now that always struck me the way that's practiced as something very distant from a chat approach, and I'd like to discuss with you afterwards uh, about this. But what's the unit of analysis when you're doing these? opinion surveys it's not an opinion survey it's not even a survey it, it's sort of a the unit of analysis of the concourse the ideas running together and and you try to understand the entire or sort of a sphere of ideas that are running together and then and then within it you try to understand which groups of people uh, share their opinions for for example, with with the Q methodology, I, I did one one interesting study uh, with my colleague Dan Durnig. I, I can tell about. So Dan is a professor, American professor of University of Georgia. I was at the time with University of Uzgur, uh, National University in Ukraine, Uzgurad State University, and we use the Q methodology to analyze the attitudes of the young students towards the management and manager like active Soviet managers and American management. Uh, so we were under assumption that we will see distinct cultural grouping. We will say that Ukrainian managers and students will grouped in one group in one factor we call it, and they'll have similar attitude towards the management and Americans will be on another side. So uh, to our surprise, it was very interesting discoveries that the old, um, old generation of American managers and old generation of Soviet managers shared the world view towards management, whether the students, the youngsters actually grouped together. So it wasn't the cultural divide, it was a generational divide. So Q will allow you to kind of play with this sort of ideas running together in the concourse and then see, and you never know what the resulting factors will be. You never know, like we didn't know that oldsters of both countries are quite similar in the sort of restrictive worldviews, let's put it this mildly. And the youngsters, you know, both countries were similar in trying to be more free and more respectful, respected, respectful to the, you know, human beings and uh, value freedom more rather than restriction. Right. So I, I think that's that study illustrated that Q could be sometimes useful as an initial uh, step to dialoguing about the complexities of subjectivity. But you're right in the sense that there's not too much for God's skin in, in Q, right? Yeah, very interesting indeed. Um, activity theory, it seems to me, uh, has contributed uh, particularly in understanding motivation and it's something that uh, I mean it's there in Vygotsky's ideas but it seems to me it's, a, it's something that activity theory particularly fruitfully developed um, could you tell me how you understand the, the problems of motivation uh, especially among young people and its role in the formation of personality uh -oh. Well, that, that's a very interesting question. It's a very, very abstract one in a sense, but if we take it in, in the framework of activity theory, uh, one of the most powerful uh, works of Leontiev, as you know, is called 
uh, деятельность, сознание, личность. So it's activity, consciousness, and personality, right? If I translate it. That. And, and that, that's a textbook which we studied in Moscow University from the very beginning for, for a young student like I was. It was a tad difficult to understand how profoundly deep the work was. But given the years past, now I appreciate that. So in, in a nutshell, uh, the proposal Leontiev has for, for the structure of the personality is this hierarchy of motivation, right? And, and, and the struggle between different motives for different activities a person has to overcome to, to really to become a personality. In that sense, uh, Leontiev is not far from Vygotsky, who, who looked at the personality development similar way. He, he was not saying things like, Vygotsky said, well, the, the, um, you have to become personality. You're not born personality, right? You, you have to overcome a lot of struggles through your life to actually individualize yourself from the social hodgepodge you're born into. Right, so you're born into a family and caregivers, and you go to school. But to become a personality, you have to crystallize your own cultural motives of existence. So, in that sense, uh, sort of, of course, the analysis of motivation of personality is, uh, is is very important for actually talking about development and how children continue to develop the motives for different activities and. There is lots. I, I don't know what else you want me to talk about, but but definitely the, the topic is of profound importance, right? Oh, I'll, I'll press some uh, questions on you to take that a bit further. Um, there's this word I'll probably pronounce it terribly: otnoshenia, or otnoshenia. Otnoshenia, yes. Yeah. It, no, uh, it's good pronunciation. Yeah. Um, the I translate it in this context of of development of motivation and personality as a commitment that someone develops a commitment to you know a certain uh, you know activity or project and on the face of it it just means a relation but it seems to me when I look at how it's used by by Leontief and by Vasilyak uh, the word uh, commitment seems to uh, ca capture encapsulate what it means. What do you think? What, what's the best way of, of explaining what Otnoshenia means uh, in English? Uh, yeah, commitment also comes in and in terms of if you if you look again, like when, when we use the Vygotsky methodology to looking at the situation, we have to give it a holistic picture first, right? So like a system into which this Otnoshenia comes in or commitment. So if I will, if, if I use that, I will think yes, the atnashenia could be interpreted as a commitment uh, in terms of uh, cultural development of personality, right? Because uh, th th again, this is for me the the process was from the childhood to the adulthood when the person has to work hard and commit to some activities to differentiate himself or herself out of the sort of a milieu, social milieu they are born into, right? So, it, and it, it's a special work because the sort of, the tendency could be, I'm just belonging to milieu and I do as, as they say, right? Say, I do everything as my mom said to me, but by the time I'm 40, it sounds a little bit strange, right? If I'm like three years old, I'm a good boy, but if I'm 40, I'm still listening to my mom, not good. So I did not make this work of differentiating myself out of my family, right, in terms of my activities. I think in, in his early work on educational psychology, Vygotsky said something like good little boys and girls do not usually become great figures or something like that. Um, that's right, but we, we become yeah. something. Yeah, and that that work starts early on, even when we have this uh, empirical studies of early childhood play, when the children have to imagine themselves a villain, they would refuse because they say, "My mom said I'm a good boy. I cannot play a villain, right?" But gradually they start to differentiate themselves from that 
what my mom said about me, right? So this commitment to your idea of atnashenye as a commitment to some activity, I mean, it, it's, it's a fair interpretation, but it's only kind of part of it, right? So I suggest to take that commitment part and look to the largest system to which it belonged to, right? And, and that, that larger system would be something like drama of someone's life, right? Mm. Creating myself, my personality in mm. this culture, mm. right? Okay, which brings me back, you mentioned before that in becoming a, an individual, if you like, becoming a, a developed personality, a person has to overcome certain, they have to have certain struggles. Now, I take this as a reference to the Perijavanya that they uh, have to work through. Uh, would that be right? Yes, the Perezivania definitely asks for the into our discussion, jumps in, right? Because that's exactly what uh, Vygotsky sort of suggests that at the, roughly the age of seven crisis, children started to have these things which he called Perezivania as a new unit of analysis in which the, you can divide child or environment, right? It's kind of a unit of analysis, it's a unity. And uh, Vygotsky wrote that in age uh, seven, children finally and this uh, sort of have this perjivania that it's me who is angry, right? So he, he doesn't think younger children still have this capacity to sort of Take them totally out of the social hotspot milieu in which they find themselves, right? So they, they say, oh, my mom is angry, I must be angry. But finally, at age seven, they have this new formation. They can now say, I am angry, I am out of this situation, I am above this situation now, and I can reflect upon my perjivania now, right? And, and if you think about it, it's sort of profound new formation, something which younger children don't have. And it, it relates, listen to me, uh, it relates to this idea of Vygotsky, uh, the crisis seven, why seven? Because that's where the children would go to school in Russia. And that's when they would introduce to the written language. So, and you cannot learn written language as a cultural tool, which is a different from oral language, unless you have this capacity of perjivania and self-reflection, self right? So a child who arrives to the school as a perfect narrator, they, they perfected the oral language, they can tell you the stories. All of a sudden they have to look at their language from sort of other position, right? From outside of the oral language. And, and that's where this perezivania as a self-reflective capacity had to translate into English terms, right? Uh, kicks in, according to Vygotsky. And it's profoundly important that the, the concept of Perezvania, as you know, because you edited the special topic, Mind, Culture, and Activity uh, journal, what was it? 2016, I believe, right? 2017. A few years ago. A few, few years ago. But, but you know how many interpretations of Perezvania is, uh, and it's it's very important unit of analysis for Vygotsky theory, which I believe still you know, need to be, we need to continue to discuss and dialogue about, right? Because it sort of fits into the personality development, cultural development, but also connects to all kind of uh, other things like consciousness, for example, because some people treat Perezivani as a unit of consciousness. And, and the difficulties we have discussing all of this, because as you know, as with personality or consciousness, this uh, terminology has a different citizenship in North American discourse, right? They belong to different fields with the different meanings. So people have a hard time to discuss this. Well, personality is a very polysemous word in English. It can mean very different things in different, to different people, different conversations. And I understand that Lichnost is the same. But it seems to me when I, I read uh, the famous work that you referred to, Activity, Consciousness and Personality, that Lichnos takes on a fairly definite meaning in that work uh, around, built around the 
uh, development of, of, as I say, commitments uh, that I think uh, Leontief says something like he puts aside, um, oh, the, forget the term he uses, but uh, modes of psychological something or other, but it, it's the Lichnost that he's talking about uh, there is much more tied up with a person's orientation to the world rather than like whether they're uh, courageous, for example, or timid, or whether they're very extroverted. Th those things are sort of set to the side and it's, uh, that theory is much more oriented to the development of the person as a citizen, you know, as a leader or a follower, a public kind of persona. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, I totally agree that, that because we're talking about cultural historical activity theory, right? So we cannot talk about personality or leechness, which translated into personality as some somewhat sort of insulated individual characteristics, right? Like timidness or shyness, right? And in cultural historical activity theory, we, we view a personality, a leechness, as a cultural active agent, right? and very much open to the social relationship around him or her, very much as a stand in the culture, like wh who am I in, in this culture, right? It's not the individual sort of a biological characteristics that, you know, I, I'm taller than you or I, I'm, I'm smarter than you. It's not, it's not about that at all. That's why I say when the personality takes a citizenship in different fields with the different theories behind it, it's very hard to untangle it for people, but pretty much all with uh, Soviet psychology, we work on this all the time, right? Untangling the other meanings for the word. And behind this meaning, it's already some particular theory exists, right? For example, you know, we, we know that personality is being used in psychiatry, right? It was a very specific characteristic, but that definitely not what we think when we talk leechness, right? And, and I, here I totally agree with you, right? M moving on from there, uh, we get to emotions. Um, now, that whole volume of Vygotsky's collected works that's devoted to the emotions, m my own impression in reading that is that he, he, he didn't actually achieve what he wanted to. He made some very important insights in, in that uh, volume but he never arrived, for instance, at a unit of analysis for emotions, and it seems to have been left for later generations to develop the theory of emotions. What is your opinion about that? Well, uh, like with everything in Vygotsky um, endeavor, we need to ask yourself uh, ourselves the question. We can, like one thing we know for sure, Vygotsky never discussed any psychological function, including emotion, as an isolated function, right? Uh, and, and the teaching about emotion eventually was part of his psychological system teachings, right? So the very quest, the first question, if you, if you recall the volume about emotions, he does go a, a great deal discussing in the relationship with things like uh, will, freedom on one hand, the things like intellect and concept development on another hand, right? So, and, and the, the least thing he wants us to think about emotion as some sort of a uh, biological naturalistic function which we share with animals, which we have, but it's a low type of natural emotions, right? So for Vygotsky, because emotions like everything else in his theory is a cultural, higher psychological function, we need to look at this systematically, right? Uh, one thing he definitely achieved in, uh, I think in, in his theory of emotion is treating us out of understanding emotions as if it's a biological function only, right? Right, so uh, the psychological system, as Vygotsky say, high psychological system is, um, you know, not immediate, mediated by cultural meanings, so we ought to analyze emotion in the historical content. We ought to analyze emotion in relation with other functions if we want to achieve any sort of concrete understanding of emotions. And so in that sense, 
you say there is no unit of analysis for emotions, but if we take psychological system as a unit of analysis, then relationship of emotions in thinking, for example, could be one of the productive line of discussion. You know how in, in the West people studied IQ for years, and then finally now everybody's studying EQ. And my joke is like, how about just study together, in, like as an inseparable PQ entity. for personal quotient. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for for yeah. example, right? Mm -hmm. So so I, I think Vygotsky, uh, you know, his interest to, uh, about emotions was lifelong. He started with studying the emotions of the actors in theater, right? And how these emotions could be performed or portrayed or presented. And it was a life, lifelong endeavor. So I think he has a lot of things to say about emotions. The problem is it, it's very difficult to read this opus. Like this particular piece of work is so heavily uh, sort of philosophical on one hand and so heavily natural scientific on another hand, so sort of psychophysiological that one would have to be worse than a lot of other fields of study to, to really read it carefully. Yeah, so I in think. fact, the, the problem here was that it's really a mistake to try and talk about a unit of analysis of emotion because the concept of emotion is abstracted from a whole uh, personality or activity or action. And, and really to take a unit of analysis that abstracts out of that whole is already a mistake? Is that the... It's, yeah, it would be reductionism, right? You, you reduce it to some particular analysis. It would be this atomistic analysis which Vygotsky warned us against, right? You know, this famous metaphor of H2O, Vygotsky said, yeah, you can study water, right, as a scientist, and you can break molecule of water into H2 and O2, two gases, right? But what do you know about the quality of the water? Yeah, like you, you can't, you have to do the unit analysis, not atom analysis. Uh, and the same, I believe for all the psychological functions he, you know, he proposes to think about, emotions included. Like when he did this major work with thinking and speech, in, in the thinking and speech, right? He illustrated how um, the word meaning become a unit of analysis for two different processes, thinking and speech, right? And, and I think I usually treat this uh, work of his as a model for us to think about other processes. What happened to memory when it's united with thinking? It ceased to be mechanical memory, become logical memory. What happens to emotions when they become intellectualized later on in life, right? They cease to be emotions sort of immediately related to physiological activities, right? They become connected to thinking. So this, so Vygotsky in his thinking and speech, he said the, the biggest mistake psychologists made, they, they cut too far to hydrogen and oxygen. And if they do that, they, they forget the human being, the, the holistic. In fact, the, the way you've described thinking and speech as the original meaning of the word paradigm. We use, because of um, uh, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn, it's taken to mean something a bit different, but the original meaning of it is a single work that sets a new course and becomes a paradigm for what comes afterwards. And I, mm -hmm. I take thinking and speech that way as well. It doesn't attempt to solve all the problems of psychology, but it, it shows how problems mm -hmm. of psychology can Agreed. be approached yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and very elegantly so so if you if you if you careful and learn that way of thinking and carefully read thinking and speech then you have some other ways in analyzing other processes which will prevent you from sort of being reductionist i think i'd like to talk about the future of chat for a minute a minute um, we've mentioned already that we both agree that chat is more like a, a family than a, a, a sort of a, a doctrine cast from a single piece of steel, to quote an unfortunate uh, historical reference. Um, at the same time, we live in a world where eclecticism, the, the random and, and chaotic mixing of different you know, uh, heterogeneous theories together, 
uh, seems to dominate. Everyone has their own particular mixture of, of, of incompatible theories. So I worry about what is the future for chat, which has these definite, quite special historical roots and, and very indefinite and important ideas that guide it. And, and I, I fear for these uh, insights being lost in a, in a future dominated by eclecticism. How do you see this future? Is it an impossible situation or can we deal with it? It's an interesting way you frame this question for me because I, I kind of suffer the same thing. When my, let, let me tell you my personal story. When I moved to North America, I was trying to position myself within a particular field, right? So I was asking myself a question, who am I? Am I a developmental psychologist? Am I an educational psychologist? And I would go to different conferences trying to hear what people talking about, right? And none of these fields were kind of systemic enough for me. They were kind of a cutting nomenclature of the problems too deep. So at some point I decided, heck, I just called myself a Gutskin psychology, psychologist, right? Because that uh, the Gutskin theory it is like more systemic, like more systematic thinking about human development and learning and teaching. And I remember very clearly an American Education Research Association meeting in San Diego was one of the colleagues at, at the dinner after the conference say, no, you cannot do that, Natalia because none of the field will recognize you as their own, right? So I actually leave the problem you hear about through my sort of trying to establish myself in North America and saying like, no, I still call myself a Gutskin psychologist because I still believe that just following Vygotsky in chapter six, thinking and speech, I think I believe that systemic knowledge is the most powerful knowledge attained by civilization. And if we cease to value systemic knowledge, we will succumb to this uh, sort of episodic knowledge. And the danger there is that it could serve us very well in this one small kind of a uh, neatly designed context. But in, in, as soon as the context shifts, your episodic knowledge, you like you're out of knowledge, right? Because in a different context, the only thing which can help you is this systemic knowledge to analyze what happened, right? And, and we see it, we, we see it all, all over the places that people are not willing to shift the context. And if they're forced to shift the context, they kind of wander around. They, they don't know how to deal with this situation. So I don't know if it's a problem of chat or if like only people who work in chat, or it's just a problem of sort of education system not valuing systemic knowledge because becoming more and more complex. So it's very hard to teach systemic concepts. Uh, teachers may be not prepared to teach systemically, right? Not maybe, no for sure, because I teach them, these future teachers. <laughs> and I, when I bring the idea of a systemic knowledge, they, they go like, oh no, no, I don't need to know what is, what my students will learn in math in the grade six, I only teach math grade three. And I'm like horrified, right? Because you can't teach math unless you have a systemic understanding of math. But that sort of a, it, it's sort of a lingering problem, I think. But I, I'm, I think I'm kind of optimistic. I teach a lot of teachers and, and I bring to their attention the value of systemic knowledge. And I see a lot of people who do possess systemic or, or strive to possess systemic knowledge, not only episodic, not all of the people around me, but still. I think that's Vygotskyan idea that the cultural knowledge is a systemic knowledge, not episodic and not sort of everyday knowledge. I think in the last uh, part of the 1929 uh, document on the crisis of psychology, he says that he aims to build a general psychology not some special theory of psychology, but a general psychology. And so I think that your, your aims here are, are true to, to that idea, not to be boxed into some corner of some speciality, uh, but on the one hand to, you know, to run up your banner, you're a Vygotskyist, and uh, you put yourself forward, you're, 
in a, a you know an associate dean of a department in an important university. You're not locked away in some ghetto, and you're fighting on you know as far as psychology as a, as a general theory of, of of culture and and human activity. So I think I think that's very good. Um, I think this is the the best kind of note to finish up on. I had a couple of other questions, which I'll probably talk about to you about separately. But thank you very much for uh, that talk. Is there just to finally are there any other things that we haven't covered that you would like to say? Uh, thank you, first of all, very much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. it, it it's fun to talk with the colleague uh, about these issues. I think I would. I wish for us and for our field and for our future generation to have a little bit more um, sort of experimental support for our argument. I, I, I don't know if the youngsters will take me up on that, but I think there could be so many exquisite experiments created, right? To not to only theorize about the things about, you know, learning development, personalities, but to actually um, see if it, if anything changed from the time Vygotsky created it, right? Like things like, you know, is it crisis of seven years old, uh, actually happening in seven years old kids in Australia or North America, or maybe it's happening earlier, or maybe it's happening later, right? There is, uh, is it uh, everyday knowledge concept and uh, systemic concept development moving the same way that Vygotsky envisioned in his time and in history and part. So I think we could have a field with a little bit more sort of um, support for our arguments. That would be my sort of vision for the future, but I'll leave it to youngsters. 